Hello everyone and welcome back to DeFi. In this segment we're going to talk about the people who participate in financial markets. Usually when we think about people who buy and sell in financial markets, there are two broad classes of people. First of all, they're retail investors or households. So these are small people. Usually we think of them as being risk averse, so they don't like a risk. They're essentially looking to build wealth for the future, and they're also looking to potentially hedge their risks. The other class of investor in the market, we usually refer to as hedge funds or institutions. We think of these as essentially being risk neutral. They are sophisticated and potentially informed. By informed, we don't necessarily mean that they're trading on private information which is a proprietary and potentially illegal thing to do, we mean that they have a sophisticated understanding of prices, price formation, perhaps liquidity and liquidity formation, and they're better able to predict short-term movements in prices. We think that these type of traders are primarily making profits. Sometimes they're hedging positions because they've provided securities to other people and they're laying off risk as part of their natural business plans. So what do we know about retail investors? Once again, I want to emphasize that we think that they don't trade on superior information. Essentially, they're just trading for private motives. Many empirical studies have shown that retail investors frequently hold inefficient portfolios, so they could do better in their investment decisions. The sorts of problems that they run into is their portfolios are not properly diversified. Essentially, they're taking on too much risk for the return that they're getting. They also buy the wrong sorts of assets. Sometimes you can improve your overall wealth by buying assets that don't necessarily move in lockstep with, for example, your employment income. We find that retail investors don't make these kinds of decisions. The other thing about retail investors that's important to remember is that they typically face very high trading fees. Trading fees can either be explicit, in which case you know that you're paying a certain amount to enter a market or to get a portfolio. So for example, you can think about the loads that you have to pay on your mutual funds. The other type of trading fees that are more perhaps insidious are implicit trading fees, distortions in the process that come about because retail investors aren't that sophisticated. We also know that retail investors trade too much. They incur uh, trading fees because of this, and they don't necessarily hold the best portfolio all the time. What about hedge funds? Hedge fund is a technical term and it refers to a very specific legal investment vehicle. It's limited in the number of people who participate, and there are certain disclosure requirements that come about with hedge funds. As a broad class, hedge funds are to some extent a black box. We don't quite know what goes on inside them. They take resources from investors, typically high net worth individuals or sophisticated investors, and they generate return distributions. You should bear this in mind when we think about some of the portfolio management applications in DeFi. One other characteristic of hedge funds that's useful to note, and this also extends to large investment banks who have uh, a trading desk, is they frequently take levered positions. Uh, By leverage, I mean they borrow in order to invest. And leveraging is a very, very common practice in financial markets. You lever up a portfolio because you want to both increase the risk and the return. To get a sense of how powerful leverage is, think about the following. You have $1 of your own money that you plan to invest. In addition, you borrow 50 cents and invest in total $1.50 in the stock. And let's just suppose that the stock has a very particular outcome characteristic, 
which it starts off at a value of one dollar and then with equal probability it either doubles in value or halves. What does your return distribution look like? Well, there are two outcomes from the stock. It either doubles in value or halves. So the return is either 100% or minus 50%. Your stock position, you invested $1.50. If it doubles, your stock position is worth $3. If it halves, your stock position is worth 75 cents. In both cases, you have to return the payment on the loan, which is 50 cents, the amount that you borrowed. We're assuming that the interest rate is zero. That leaves you, in one case, a return or a total of $2.50, and in the other case, 25 cents, which on your original investment of a dollar implies a return of 150% or minus 75%. So from a security that either doubled or halved with equal probability, you've managed to magnify the return on your portfolio. You've managed to magnify both the return and the risk on your levered portfolio. Leverage is very attractive to institutional investors just because of the way it magnifies risk and return. Sophisticated investors will also use various derivative securities in order to get leverage-like features on their returns. In the previous segment, we talked a little bit about options. Options, futures, contracts for difference, which are another sort of derivative security. All of these generate payoffs that look like levered payoffs. Let me give you a concrete example about what happens when a sophisticated player is levered. You may remember the case of Archigos Capital, a very large bankruptcy that happened earlier this year. Archigos was a hedge fund and a family fund that borrowed from multiple prime brokers. You can think of a prime broker as essentially being a bank for hedge funds and institutional clients. What was particular about this case is that none of the prime brokers had discussed with each other how much they'd actually lent to Archigos. The other thing that you need to know to understand the sequence of events is that Archigos had invested in a very concentrated portfolio. That means that they'd only bought a limited number of assets. In addition, they used those specific assets as collateral for the loans that they'd taken out from the different prime brokers. So what happened? The value of the collateral fell. There was a news event and some of the stocks that they'd invested in lost ground. At that point, all the prime brokers were worried that the value of the collateral had fallen and that Archigos had not given them enough for safekeeping. They issued margin calls and basically asked Archigos to come up with more capital or more proof that they could eventually repay the loan. Of course, Archigos couldn't do this. So what happened? One of the prime brokers started to sell the collateral. Because the collateral was used as the collateral on all the other loans, as, he, as this company started to sell, the price of the underlying securities dropped, everyone else's collateral fell in value, and it became clearer and clearer that Archigos would not be able to repay their loan. The story of Archigos is a systemic event. Many different prime brokers were all exposed to the same risk, and something happened to Archigos, and it affected them all. Luckily, everyone was well capitalized enough that there were no bankruptcies as a result of, of the Archigos failure. There could well have been, and the purpose of regulation is to prevent something like the Archigos failure from wiping out a large number of financial firms. In the next segment, we'll discuss in a bit more detail how people actually trade and access markets in traditional finance. I'll see you there.